So, you want to make a lot of credits real quick, and, well, basically this is the easiest way for you to do it, then. Hunt down bounties, bring back the scum who have fled from justice, and get paid for it. Oh, and by the way, it's probably going to be the easiest game you've ever played. Welcome to Bounty Hunter. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and uh, today we are looking at the TTRPG Bounty Hunter. It is a diceless system. Now, Bounty Hunter was written by me. I wrote this uh, for my partner who wanted to have a role-playing system that was super light, super easy to play, and didn't have a vast amount of rules. As you can see, this book, which includes an adventure and a region, comes in at 84 pages. So that's not a lot of pages uh, for a rule system. Now, the rules can actually be compressed significantly. There's lots of examples and stuff in here. So today, I am reviewing Bounty Hunter, the good, the bad, the ugly, as well as if you have been following the creation process of of this series, you will remember that probably in January, I want to say, I posited the idea of creating your own RPGs, and then we expanded upon that in February, and this now is the culmination a few months later, a completely from the ground built role-playing system called Bounty Hunter. So let's jump straight into it, shall we? When we get to the basics, the very basic idea behind Bounty Hunter is everything a role revolves around action points. So all characters and all NPCs. They are not asynchronous, by the way. They are asymmetrical, I should say. In Bounty Hunter, both NPCs and PCs are identical. They have the same identical character sheets because the character sheets are so simple and it allows for an elegant kind of mechanical balance, I feel. Nonetheless, all characters within Bounty Hunter have action points. Now, action points are a nebulous term representing mental fatigue, spiritual endurance as well as physical damage and every time a character wants to do something they simply need to spend one action point and then they succeed at doing it. Now that's the basic principle behind Bounty Hunter. If the character has the skill and they have the AP to spend then they succeed. So the game is not so much about does the dice or does fate or does chance allow your character to succeed. It is now quite simply up to the player whether their character succeeds or not. So where does the tension come in? Where does the risk of failure come in? It's not so much a risk of failure as it is a risk of running out of AP. AP can only be recovered in very limited ways with medical assistance or with healing kits and the like. But in general, it only comes back after a good solid eight hours of sleep, which, only can, which can only be performed once every 24 hours. So your AP pool is sacred. You don't want to spend a lot of AP in, in any one particular engagement because you never know what the next engagement might entail. So the balance of AP versus the actual successes is important. So the players are going to be given a lot of choices. Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to succeed or do you want to fail? The players have the choice of success, but they equally have the choice of failure when they know they need to keep that AP back. And we're going to have a look at AP in a little bit when we come back to talk about initiative. But effectively, everything revolves around AP. When you, when, when you run out of AP... Your character is unable to perform anything, and should they need to spend additional AP, they actually f uh, pass out from fatigue. They, they literally run out of mental or physical or emotional energy and can no longer perform anything and will fail automatically. So we have some skills I spoke about. There is quite an extensive list of skills in Bounty Hunter covering, I think, a pretty wide range of all of the skills that you could possibly look at. And something that we have desperately tried to do within Bounty Hunter is to make sure that that all-consuming computer use skill, which does crop up in a lot of science fiction games as being the, the end-all kind of um, skill, we've made sure that it isn't. We've distributed a lot of skills over various things. So, for example, to hack into a computer, you don't use computer acumen, you use hacking. 
for example. Um, whereas if you're trying to build a computer, you use engineering. Um, if you're trying to build an AI that is going to do all sorts of weird, wonderful things, it might be engineering plus computer acumen plus hacking, um, if uh, that is the case. You do get some chain skills every now and again, which requires you to spend more AP, by the way, to succeed. So that little AP pool of yours is ticking down. And just so that you know, all starting characters start with 20 AP. That's 20 successes for a given day. So that quite literally means they can have a success an hour. Uh, and then for the next four hours whilst they're sleeping, hopefully they don't need any more successes. So there's quite a range of skills for the characters to choose from. There are, are so many skills, as a matter of fact, that a character who gets to maximum level, not that level means a huge amount in Bounty Hunter, but when you get to maximum level, you still wouldn't have all of the skills available. So no one character becomes the master of all. With skills comes abilities. Now, character abilities are limited. Characters get to choose one ability at character creation, and I think they gain a total of three or four by the time they get to, again, that idea of maximum level, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But... Um, the abilities generally allow the characters to perform two or three actions in a round that don't cost any AP to spend. So again, it's about the conservation of AP and working out the balance they're, they're in. Um, or it allows them to do some pretty cool stuff. The ace pilot, for example, can f fly a starship as well as fire weapons in the same turn. Um, and that's once per scene. And that's what we then talk about is that um, you have dramatic scenes and then you have um, non-dramatic scenes. Dramatic scenes are combat. For example, non-dramatic are downtime, social interactions, and the like. When it comes to combat, combat is fairly straightforward. You have two phases. You have the first phase and the last phase. Any character who wishes to act in the first phase, and that's NPCs or PCs, has to spend one AP to act first. So there's that AP pool being hit very, very quickly. They then get to act... If they want to then do something in that first round, such as, for example, dodge or perhaps make an attack themselves or try and intimidate an enemy, they have to spend the appropriate AP to do that. So if you're going first, you're generally spending two AP to act first in that first phase. Now, anything that you do in the first phase is resolved in the first phase before we get to the last phase. If you want to act in the last phase, you don't spend any AP to act in the last phase, so you're conserving some AP, but you cannot then react to anything that happened in the first phase. You can only react to things that happened in the second or the last phase, I should say. So you can't dodge attacks made in the first phase. And remember, folks, there is no chance of failure. If someone fires a weapon at you and they spend one AP, it will hit you unless you take their suitable dodge action, which would then mitigate that hit. But you can only dodge if you're acting in the same phase within that initiative. Now, that phase cycle happens at the beginning of every round of combat. So one round you might be acting first, the next round you might decide, actually, you want to act second. You don't need to spend that extra AP or you need to conserve that AP. And uh, that's pretty much how combat works. Very straightforward. Weaponry, you have good old-fashioned punching, which every character can do. Then you have martial arts, which is hand to, uh, literally unarmed combat, basically. You then have melee combat, weapons, axes, swords, chairs, and the like. Then you have ranged combat, which is... Uh, Small firearms and large firearms, they do a lot of damage. You get hit by some of the uh, heavier rifles and things, they will do 7 AP damage in a single shot. So you do want to get out of the way of those uh, shots. Combat is very deadly. And then you have mounted weapons, which is for starship combat, which we'll get to right now, as a matter of fact. Starship combat utilizes the systems that I've developed for other role-playing games, such as a complete guide to nautical campaigns. Starship positioning is relative. It is assumed that all starships can fire in all different directions because that's just a smart way to design starships um, for use in space. Again, we have this idea of different roles aboard the ship, except these roles now are tied to your skills. So if you have a certain skill set, you could be the captain of the ship and um, each role provides an additional set of abilities. So a captain of the starship, for example, can attempt to motivate the rest of their crew by giving a rousing speech, spending one AP, and then every member of their crew regains an AP point. So that's quite useful. You've got the engineer who can transfer starship AP, although it's called power points in this case, but it's starship AP from one system to another to reinforce it if it's been taking damage or to enhance it so that it could either 
deal more damage or it could be half uh, effective in half the amount of time it would normally be. Uh, for example, calculating how to get the ship to jump into a dive, which is the um, faster than light transportation system that I use in the setting. Starship combat is very, very dynamic. It's very fluid and... Um, is equally dangerous for the starships. Of course, if a starship reaches zero power points or AP, the starship is destroyed and all aboard are in serious trouble. Starship combat is designed that it doesn't really matter what character you have built, you will always have something to do on that starship during starship combat. I hate the idea of a starship combat happening and the doctor going, well, I'm going to sit back and do nothing because I only have medicine skills to heal the party. And right now it's the starship that's being hit. So the roles allow characters to be able to be a bit more versatile and actually participate in starship combat, if you want to have that, for example. Now, just before I move on to the character options, one of the most important questions that comes up when we are talking about uh, the Bounty Hunter TTRPG is, what if I don't want to play a Bounty Hunter? That's absolutely fine. This is a science fiction uh, role-playing game. You don't have to play a bounty in order to uh, play bounty hunters. You could play pilots, you could play doctors, you could play lawyers, you could play anything you like. The, uh, the, the universe is yours for the taking, as a matter of fact. We just happened to call it bounty hunters. That was the core idea behind creation, um, the creation process. It kind of helped focus us as well in terms of what abilities and powers and things were included. When we get to character uh, options, there are a brand new bunch of alien species. This is my own campaign setting, which you don't have to use to play Bounty Hunter. You can use any science fiction setting, any sci-fi setting that you like. It doesn't really matter. Um, in the uh, core rulebook, the basic basic rulebook, um, species have one extra skill that they add to the um, character. But if you get the um, Huntari region, which is included in the omnibus of the rules anyway, that includes rules for uh, a whole bunch of new species species and it elaborates and expands upon them and gives them more more powers as well as um, including a lot of planetary uh, information and the like so lots of plants uh, and, and and that sort of thing so character creation um, this is one of the sections that most people have found the most useful part of the whole system and I must admit I was very happy and satisfied with this when I finished it has been inspired by some other TTRPGs out there of course um, but I think this is very efficient if you are using something like Foundry VTT which is one of the uh, it's the only only VTT platform to actually support Bounty Hunter, or will do as soon as we finished with the uh, modules and things. Um, you can make a character in under a minute, uh, four minutes if you include purchasing equipment. So it's a very quick way of creating characters, and all that it is is broken down into nine steps, and each step guides you on your character creation process. Now, most of the steps have a little bit of a biography that comes with them. So when you choose, for example, the spacer background, so you were born on a starship in space, you get certain skills because of being born in space and understanding how starships work, but you also get a small paragraph. Now, this paragraph is entirely up to you to include or to exclude in your character biography, but all you do is copy and paste that biography into your character sheet, add in two names, which the biography will prompt you for, and then you have a short entry on where your character was born. As you build your character, you are adding more of these little paragraphs and creating, by the end of it, not only a character that is reflective of their past, but you also have a complete character backstory with a whole bunch of friends, allies, enemies, home planets, and all kinds of things thrown into the mix for almost no effort whatsoever. So the character creation process, a lot of people have said it's very organic, it makes sense, and by the end of it, you walk away with a very, very complete character. So I think it's a it's it's a testimony to to just wanting to make this as simple and as easy as possible. That the most work that you will be doing in this TTRPG is not maths and paging backwards and forwards to see what bonuses and stats uh, adjustments you get, but more in terms of building your narrative, building your story. And that's always been my focus. I'm very pleased that that seems to be coming across. Now, another thing that we need to take into consideration is that Bounty Hunter doesn't really have any classes. You can't play the Bounty Hunter class or the Pilot class or the this class. What happens is you get your skills and those skills will 
indicate that you should go more towards being the gunner of the starship or perhaps being the captain of the starship, depending on what skill sets you have, not on what particular focus you took. Now, one of those steps in your character creation is career path, and there are some careers in there that you could have taken that would then indicate a particular class choice, but there is no such thing as a class. All skills are available to all characters of all races, uh, or species, I should say, not races, um, of all species. And again, that just makes it very fluid and, and you tell the story that you want to tell. When it comes to lore, we spoke about very briefly the Huntari region, which is a collection of 20 or 19 planets that uh, I have created. Each planet is quite distinct, um, hopefully, um, with a lot of information. There's names of taverns, there's names of hotels, there's regions, there's cities, there's export commodities and the values that they have, as well as every single section within the Huntari region comes with a whole list of bounties, which is really just a fancy term for adventure hooks. So there are a lot of different adventure hooks. And uh, <clears throat> that leads me on to the idea of the bounties. Now, the bounties are effectively effectively a leveling system, but at the same time a reputation system. And what happens is the characters will go on adventures, they will go after bounties. And in the book, there's a whole section on how to create your own bounties with the, the cost of what the bounty would, would pay out the characters, plus some guidelines on how to create a different bounty hunting options, because so often bounty is, here's the person, go find the person, the person resists, get back. There are many different ways of creating a bounty, and the book contains quite a lot of suggestions on how to do that. Um, the Huntari region, a lot of people have said it's like sci-fi light. It's like general sci-fi, and that's exactly what I tried to do. I didn't want it to be too law heavy. You don't have to go and learn thousands and thousands of pages worth of law. It is a case of, well, that's, that's that kind of species. That's that kind of species, kind of keeping it fairly light and also fairly modern as well in terms of the technology that's available to the characters. So the players won't be overwhelmed with trying to remember what a transflux inducer is and why the core capacitor needs to have a hyperdrive motivator attached to it. We don't need any of that kind of stuff here. We're bounty hunters and we're playing and we want to have fun. So the law setting is fairly light at the moment. There have been calls for an, an additional book to come out in terms of expanding that region, but that's for another time. Okay, when we get to support, how is this book supported? Where can we go to support this book? Well, I have to say one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is our long-standing relationship with Dungeon Fog. And as a result, Dungeon Fog has created an entire new pack of sci-fi assets, which I helped to design and to come up with specifically for use in sci-fi campaigns and in Bounty Hunter. We actually collaborated with them and worked with the artist to create all of these different props that you can use to create even more and even more epic Bounty Hunter maps and just general sci-fi maps um, for your own use. Now, we've also partnered with Foundry VTT, and the module is nearly finished. I have to say, it's absolutely amazing. Foundry VTT is, of course, a virtual tabletop and our virtual tabletop of choice uh, for running your games. And the beauty of running it in Foundry VTT is not only does it keep track of your character's AP, not that that's a particular chore, but what I do like about it is that you can export your maps directly from Dungeon Fog into Foundry VTT, and it brings across all of the wall information, the light information and all that kind of wonderful stuff so that you literally are creating a map, importing it into Foundry and off you go. You've got the entire system at your fingertips. So that I think is incredibly strong support. And of course, you can download various forms that the book uses, the character sheets and the starship sheets, for example, from our website as well. And uh, that, of course, is uh, in the uh, folders where all of our uh, downloadable files are. When we talk about the strengths, what are the strengths of this system? It's a very straightforward system, and most players, if they've had any experience role-playing before, will be able to pick it up in literally a few seconds. This is how it works, this is what you do, one AP for every action, and that's it, you're golden, off you go. For newer players, I have designed it with the intention that new players who have never role-played before can pick it up and go, okay, what do I do? Well, what do you want to do? Do you have the skill? Yes, spend one AP, you do the skill. That's as simple as it can get. There's no confusing dice. There's none of that sort of thing. Let's take it out. Now, 
On the other side, there are some expanded rules in the book to accommodate for more experienced role players who are going, well, I like that, but one AP at a time is not edgy enough. I want more pressure on my players. So there is a small section that expands on the rules in terms of allowing players to bid different numbers of AP when they're in a contest against one another or in a contest against a, the, the difficulty that the GM then determines, and then they have to spend more AP to overcome that difficulty, and they don't know what that AP spend is. It's a range of one to five. So either they're spending five or they're spending one. It's up to them or anywhere in between, of course. It's up to them to try and decide how desperately they want to succeed versus staying alive because that AP pool stays the same. And then, of course, there are variants that some fans have already created. And those variants um, allow you to add in a die to create an air of randomness, although the system doesn't have that as an inherent rule mechanic. So the strengths of it are that it is adaptable. It is very, very simple. When it comes to its weaknesses, what are its weaknesses? At the moment, its weaknesses are is that it is very light. So if you are looking for a role-playing game where you can spend hours pondering over all the different builds to meticulously create the ultimate character, you're not going to find it here. You have There are certain optimizations of character building that you can go with if you want to go for the best pilot in the universe, but you can only ever have one of the skill. You can't be a better pilot by having more pilot skill. You can only have one pilot skill, so all pilots will have the same piloting skill. However, how you use your AP is entirely up to you, and that's more of a personal player uh, development uh, notion than the actual player character. So it is incredibly rules light from that perspective. There are lots of things that we excluded from the book simply because we didn't want to overwhelm new players in terms of complexity. So some, some things are kept very simple, more advanced role players will go, I, I want more on this, I want more on that, I need more of this. Why is the equipment list only 50 objects? I need it to be 500 objects. Uh, there are only 12 starships, I want 24 starships. We would of course love to have expanded this beyond its, its uh, scope, but that would not be the original plan of the project. So it is fairly simple from that. It's brand new, so not a lot of people will be playing it, but given its limited barriers to entry, I think it can get in quite quickly. Those are the weaknesses as far as I can see them. Um, people who've played it haven't really commented on any other weaknesses, although we have asked them for it. So if you have been part of the Bounty Hunter Kickstarter or the playtesting thereafter, leave your comments down below on what you think about Bounty Hunter itself. When we come to the look and feel, we always talk about look and feel. It feels a bit weird for me to talk about the look and feel because I designed the, 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 the look. The feel came from our standard designer, the very talented Martin Hughes from uh, M3H. Uh, he did the layout of the book, and you've seen examples throughout the entire, entire book of this beautiful, beautiful layout of, of starship details and uh, everything. So um, he did that. I, I would have to say that when you look at it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's fairly clean. As gamers, we tried to design it so that it made the most sense possible. And But that sometimes, you know, the decisions are made because of page count and the like. Um, so that, that does happen. Um, the artwork, I made all of the artwork um, and tried to keep it as neutral as possible in terms of sci-fi setting, as representative as possible um, to try and keep things um, going. Um, and so I've been very happy with, with the look and the feel and the layout of it. We have found some layout issues. There was one paragraph that we were like, why is that over there, not over there? I remember now why we did it. It was simply um, a case of, well, it has to go somewhere and, and there is where it fits. So there are some choices like that, but every design book goes through those kinds of things. Um, it is at the moment printed as a saddle stitched uh, A4 book. Um, that's because of the requirements that the Kickstarter had originally. Um, I have to say, I was very skeptical when it was going to be a, a printed book like this. I'm like, well, really? But to be absolutely honest with you, it's so easy just to flick through the book and find where you're going. And Martin has done such a good job of, I don't know if you can see it, but it is color coded. You can see there the, the core rule book is red, the settings rule book is um, blue, and then right at the end, the final adventure is 
green that's the the sample introductory adventure there um is green so it's really easy to page through and martin's layout i think putting the title on the side i thought was really 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 cool so that is bounty hunter ttrpg if you guys are looking for a sci-fi light good old-fashioned romp through the universe if firefly star trek star wars or any of those kind of want to be played but you don't want to get into the big systems that are out there I think this is a pretty good one to pick up, even if it's just a test to see whether your players are into sci-fi, sort of a cowboy-esque kind of sci-fi, rough and tumble space, uh, or not. And um, so there you are. Link down below to go and pick up that PDF from our website. And uh, that's it from me on Bounty Hunter Tabletop. Now, if you want, I can do a uh, video series. Oh, not a video series, just a video on how we put this whole book together. Because a lot of people, I'm sure you have your rule system, that your homebrew rule system, but putting a book together like this takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of little steps that I didn't fully appreciate. We've made a lot of mistakes in terms of uh, some of the things in this book. We've made a lot of successes as well. If you want that video, leave your comments down below. Now, your task for today is to create a bounty hunter. Now, it sounds very simple, but I don't want bounty hunters who've got a strange helmet on and who vaporize people. Create an interesting bounty hunter with an interesting twist. What makes them unique from all other bounty hunters? Why do people speak their names as opposed to anybody else's name? Put it down below. Let's share it. Uh, let's see what kind of bounty hunters we can come up with. And uh, let's see how many are in the book and how many aren't in the book. We did try to make it as inclusive as possible. Anyway, those are my thoughts. There is no playout sponsor message as, well, this is our own product. And I did debate long and hard, should it be a separate video or should it be a primary video? And I thought, well, we do book reviews. We do tabletop reviews from time to time. And, well, this is a tabletop role-playing game, and one that I think has pretty good, a pretty good space for playing in space, in a very simple space. Anyway, from me, uh, I wish to thank all of the backers of the Kickstarter that made the book possible in the first place. I really wish to, to thank my partner, Dominic, uh, who inspired the whole thing. And of course, as usual, I would love to thank our amazing patrons who make this entire channel possible and keep it going. Thanks to you, uh, patrons. They all got a bonus copy of uh, Bounty Hunter as being patrons um, for that for that uh, matter. And uh, thank you to you for watching all the way until the end. Until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest of bounty hunting.